Hare Krishna. So I'm grateful to be here with all of you once again today. <coughs> and we're discussing the 10th canto, the incident where Duryodhan is going to be severely humiliated. And then that leads to him wanting to get back and the disastrous incident of Draupadi is disrobing, which literally sets the fire that eventually leads to the Kurukshetra war. So we could say that if we consider a fire, the fire of envy is especially triggered in this particular incident and that leads to the, the fire of, uh, you could say, abuse or atrocity. That is what happens at the assembly. So this is, where is this happening? This is Indraprastha. So then this is, happens at Kurukshetra. Is Kurukshetra? No. Where does this happen? Astinapur. Yes, good. <coughs> and then there is the whole war that will happen at Kurukshetra, which will lead to it's a really big fire. So, in that sense, this particular incident is quite significant. <coughs> so, what exactly is going on over here? Mm. I'll talk today in three broad terms. First is the purpose, purpose of this particular description in the Bhagavatam, the purpose of this particular incident. Then I'll talk about provocation. And then lastly, I'll talk about protection. And we'll, we'll be discussing largely about the topic of envy. <coughs> now from the first time when I read this particular section in the Krishna book, and then over the years when I've read the Bhagavatam, this section has always read, raised questions in my mind. Especially uh, some of the descriptions seem a little sensuous, a little bit... Uh, a little bit too explicit for a sacred book where the water is being sprinkled on their bodies of the queens and then uh, then the description can be a little agitating. So whenever I read a book, I often read it more as an author than simply as a reader. And as an author, you try to decide, try to understand why is this particular section here. Generally, it is said that if a good book it like if, if there is a 5000 word good book and the author good author has written at least 10000 words and edited out 5000 words and the edited out 5000 words are present as an invisible weight they bring gravitas so a lot gets edited out only what is essential is kept so why is such an explicit description kept over here now, if you see, whenever there are some, some explicit seeming descriptions, where they say there's a description of uh, female beauty, then there is always a purpose. If you consider where all something similar comes, it comes in the 8th canto, the Mohini Murti pastime. At that time, the beauty of the Mohini Murti is described to some extent. Then it comes in the 10th canto in the Ras Panchadya, slightly, not much. Now, if you consider each of these places, there is a narrative purpose being served. See here, so what we are looking at is explicit descriptions. See, when you go into art a little bit, sometimes we may, if we are not from an artistic background, we may think that, uh, you no. Know, why should there be any description of anything that is likely to agitate anyone's mind? Let's not have it at all. But if you consider not all, say, descrip sensual descriptions are at the same level. There are, 
there is what is called there is romantic description then there is erotic and then there is pornographic now in the romantic descriptions the primary purpose is to describe say the relationship between two people and in association with that say if a king is fallen in love with a queen then how beautiful the queen is so for that purpose the so that time maybe the beauty of the queen is described maybe the strength and the heroism of the king is described so that serves a narrative purpose over there and in general the gopi geets tone is largely romantic <coughs> now in erotic descriptions there is a little more description of the sexual component but still there is some storyline over there and then this is what uh, will not be rated as universal movies or whatever and then where there is pornographic the whole purpose of the description is to trigger sexual desire now for some people even romantic descriptions may trigger sexual desire but that's not the purpose hmm? and that's why the, the so often in, in pornography there is no storyline at all there is no relationship evolving it's just two people uh exploiting each other or one person exploiting another whatever so we have to be careful that when scripture when there are explicit descriptions all are not the same we shouldn't be mayavadi mayavadi is everything is one isn't it so even all sensual descriptions are not one we go to jagannath temple and some of the temples in india there are some explicit seeming imagery now that is not considered obscene because that serves a architectural purpose so for example if we consider the mohini murti pastime without describing the beauty of mohini murti the over there is that the asuras have fought have strived for a long time and then they have, so they put aside their enmity with the devtas and worked with them to get the nectar then they fought with each other to try to get the nectar and then suddenly they is giving it up to some unknown woman that would not make any sense unless that woman is devastatingly beautiful she is so beautiful that her beauty just devastates their intelligence so it serves a narrative purpose similarly in the whole bhagavatam the divine romance between krishna and the gopis is the highest theme and in natural that there is some explicit description over there so uh, whenever i read this section you know i was never able to figure out what purpose is the explicit description serving over here now we may say that if you are pure hearted we will not get agitated and prabhu pat talks about that in some of the purports over here in his krishna book and that's mentioned over here that's true but why describe it at all so my small understanding is that this is whole building up to the triggering of duryodhan's envy that like hiranyakashipu described that hiranyakashipu was craving for wealth and sensual pleasure bhoga and aishwarya so we know that after this duryodhan's envy became excessive so one side of it was that he saw the sheer amount of wealth that the pandavas had got and that triggered his envy and that is true but we see in the gambling match duryodhan didn't stop with just stealing the wealth of the pandavas if he is envy had only been toward the wealth of the pandavas he could have just got their wealth and finished the whole thing but after that he tried to disrobe draupadi he tried to humiliate her so his envy duryodhan's envy was not just for the wealth that is aishwarya but it was also triggered with the bhog with the beauty sensual beauty so here it's the beauty of the queens of yudhishthir it's described over here the queens of krishna is described over here it's all of that is going on over here and then what happens by this is now 
Duryodhan, later on we know what happens. We'll come to that incident, which was, which was probably the most provocative incident. But the whole narrative is building up to how there were sites that triggered Duryodhan's envy. So it was his wealth envy, that's why in the gambling match, he took away the wealth. He robbed. But in that same gambling match, what he also did was, he disrobed. Now by disrobing, he was not going to get any wealth. It was not that the particular cloth that Draupadi was wearing was of a special value. After he had got all the wealth, like sometimes some people, some robbers rob, they not only rob your wallet, they rob your uh, bag, but they take away your clothes also. They are more interested in the money than anything else. Now that was not his interest over there. So he actually was triggered by envy. Now of course he wanted to humiliate the Pandavas through humiliating Par Draupadi, that's true. But this incident is all, all this description is building up to show how his envy is triggered. So that, that's one understanding. Now I'll, show, I'll explain how this understanding seems to make sense of the whole pastime to me. See, another past, part of this pastime which has troubled me a lot you know, there is also related to the way which how sometimes Krishna is depicted. I was in London and I was giving a class. There was one devotee. He likes to hear a lot of uh, a lot of non-iskon Bhagavatam Kathakars. And then he brings in stuff from there. And many of them have a lot of masala. So what they said is that actually uh, their argument is Krishna wanted the Kurukshetra war to happen. So I was telling, I was giving the whole theme on how Krishna tried his best to avoid the war. And Krishna himself went as a peace messenger. That's a very serious thing. So Krishna is the most powerful person. Like say now Russia, Ukraine, war is going on. And if they want to have some peace, they may have some secretary of defense or some 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 level of uh, military uh, military official they'll go. But say, if the president of Russia goes to Ukraine or the president of Ukraine goes to Russia, that means they're dead serious about the peace mission. So I said, Krishna himself going shows how serious he is. So this devotee said, actually, Krishna wanted the war to happen. So he said, while Krishna externally was telling him, was, was offering him the peace proposal, Krishna from inside the heart of Duryodhana was telling him, don't accept the peace proposal. Now, I said, you know, this is a remarkable level of contact with Krishna in the heart. <laughs> well, I find the implications a bit disturbing. Sometimes people say that everything that happens is done by God. No, we have free will. See, Krishna is the supreme controller, not the sole controller. We are also Ishwara. So it is not that when Draupadi is being disrobed, Krishna is disrobing Draupadi to Dushasa. When I said, oh, yeah, Krishna is not doing that, I said. Then, how, what, he also agreed to that. You know, Krishna is not doing that. Then how can you say that Krishna is stopping Duryodhana? Or Krishna is stopping Duryodhana from within? Where is the Shastrik reference for that? And then he gave this reference, says Krishna wanted this war to happen. And that's why later on we will see when the Pandavas see Duryodhan falling in the water. Now, that time, they, stop, they start falling, he falls and everybody starts laughing. And Yudhishthir, especially the queen start laughing and Yudhishthir tells the queens to stop laughing but Krishna says, no need to stop. So, his point was Krishna wanted to provoke Duryodhan so much that the war would happen. Well, okay, see, there are many points over here. So Krishna, first of all, he is the, he is the supreme controller. That means nothing can happen without Krishna's will. But Krishna is not the sole controller. That means he is not doing everything. When bad people do bad things, it is not Krishna doing it through them. Krishna may allow that to happen. So it doesn't happen without Krishna's sanction. Hmm? But
but there is a difference when if you sole controller means everything is krishna's intention krishna is the supreme controller means everything is with krishna's permission there is a significant difference between intention and permission the bhagavad gita says upadrashta anumanta cha so 1323 if we consider upadrashta anumanta cha krishna is saying now so everything that happens we may say is within krishna's plan that is true but that doesn't mean krishna wants everyone to do everything that they are doing it is not that krishna wants evil people to do evil things cuz what would that mean the implication of this is very disturbing it's like say sometimes police want to frame some innocent person the police are corrupt so what they do is they they want to anyway kill somebody else and they take a gun put the gun in the hand of an innocent person and they press the trigger from within his hand so his fingerprints are there on the gun and they shoot the other person and they arrest him you shot him and you are going to go to jail and you go to if you are going to be uh, executed for this so that would be monstrous so if krishna is doing everything then basically what it means is that krishna makes people do bad karma and then punishes them for doing bad karma isn't it so this is definitely not our philosophy so anyway so at that time he said that then if krishna did not want this war to happen then why did krishna not stop the queens from laughing why did in fact he stop yudhishthir from stopping them so i have been meditating on this praying for this for a long time recently i was giving a class on govardhan lila in melbourne and that time i was contemplating the whole govardhan lila and then it struck me what was going on at least that's my small understanding see there are times when krishna does provocation so the provocations are meant to be tests so for example now krishna definitely provokes indra isn't it krishna does three things first of all krishna says that you are doing the sacrifice for indra uh, there is no need you know you should do sacrifice for govardhan it's like imagine say say we are having a temple inauguration and we are inviting say the chief minister of bengal and then we disinvite that person and we get some unknown person in their place as the chief guest first of all the chief guest the chief minister will feel insulted that i was not invited and then i was replaced by an utterly unknown person that's even more provocative so first is don't do puja to indra second is give that puja to a hill and you know that is even worse and on top of that krishna uses a false philosophy this is actually krishna speaks karma mimamsa he says you know actually if you do karma you will simply get the results you know you don't have to worship anyone now if that were true then if we are only doing our karma and we get the results we don't have to worship anyone then by that logic that you don't have to worship govardhan also is it did <laughs> so the point is krishna is deliberately provoking indra now why does he do this because some in medicine sometimes what happens is a person is sick but the person is in denial that they are sick and then sometimes the doctor can give some small treatment which will curb the sickness but the doctor sometimes gives some substance which actually aggravate the sickness and then the sub patient realizes yeah i really am sick so if a patient is in denial then what has to be done is sometimes the sickness has to be aggravated to get them out of the denial hmm so then that's what denial changes to acceptance and then acceptance will lead to some kind of treatment so indra had pride but most people will not say that i'm proud but when they are triggered and they do something terrible like somebody says i you have anger issues no no i don't have any anger issues well, okay then you speak something to them and they just are about to at your throat to struggle you 
yeah i think you have a small right point <laughs> so sometimes triggering a person provoking a person is a way to force them to confront who they really are so now this is not a recommended way for everyone no so, <laughs> we shouldn't go around prov provoking everyone saying you know i want to introduce you to who you really are <laughs> <laughs> that is all. Our, our philosophy is abani na maan de na. So what Krishna does, there are some things which we do anukaran and some we do anusaran. You know, we don't, we don't, re we simply accept that Krishna has done this. We don't follow that. But here, what Krishna is doing is basically he is provoking Duryodhan. And the idea of provoking Duryodhan is then. See, everybody can act like a nice person. Generally, to know who a person really is, one of the things that we need to know is what are their boundaries. Boundaries means, see, we all can behave nicely in normal situations. But when we are angered, when we are tempted, when we are provoked, how far will we go? Mm -hmm. So, Sometimes some people may, see, we all have some boundaries. Say somebody needs a lot of money. Then, you know, we might put a second mortgage in our house. You know, we might lie to someone about why we need the money. So that they can give us some, they, they'll give us some, they'll borrow. We may need money for one thing, but we tell we need for another thing. So that they will lend us the money. We might uh, put some false statements while taking a loan. Okay, these are all boundaries we are crossing. But... See, somebody, when they need money, they go to somebody's house and they're not looking. They steal money from there. Or they, they fake somebody else's signature and swindle money from there. Or somebody goes to a bank and know, shoots a guard and then steals money. See, everybody has their boundaries. No, okay, I might do some office politics. Somebody might say, but I'm not going to break the law. You may say office politics is not a good thing to do, but that's a part of life. That's different from, say, breaking the law. So basically you could say, the character of a person is known by their boundaries. Boundaries means what we will never do. What we will never do. We all, when provoked, will do certain things which you would normally not do. But how far will we go? Say for example, normally we may speak very politely. When we get angry, we may yell at a person. But we all may have our boundaries. No matter how angry I get, I'm not going to use swear words. I'm not going to speak cuss words. Or no matter how angry I get, you know, I'm not going to slap someone or punch someone. That's out of question. So we all have some boundaries. And in one sense, the boundaries reveal you know, what the character of a person is. So, I was giving this session in America some time ago, uh, Australia actually some time ago, after Melbourne. And then one couple came to meet me after that. I was telling about how sometimes after the Govardhan Lila class only. So one couple over there came and met me. They said that they, they, they are devotees and they have been running a dating service. Before a dating service, like for, for couples to come together. And so they said that many times people want to know, especially women want to know the nature of the man before they actually want to enter into a serious relationship with him. So they say that we have a strategy. Let's say a man and a woman, they are dating, they are coming together in a hotel or something like that. They're having a meal. So we deliberately tip a waiter to go and spill some water or food on the boy's clothes. And how does the boy react at that time? That is a predictor of how much say that boy is likely to, is prone to domestic violence in the future. <laughs> <laughs> so now, normally if somebody is dating, they would want to put their best face forward. They will act very gentle and polite and everything. But when you are provoked, what do you do? Sometimes provocation is what is required to understand a person's boundaries. So what Krishna is doing over here is that Krishna is letting Duryodhana be provoked. And now, uh, you could say that actually that whole incident seems a little strange overall. Normally speaking, if somebody falls, 
no if somebody slips and falls you would say civilized people don't laugh at that you know we may just go and immediately help that person rise and assist them so that is true and yudhishthir also does that mm -hmm. he immediately tells his attendants to go and help you and he help him change his clothes and whatever so he helps him but why do they laugh see, gen see if you look at the previously what is happening there are some people who put on a lot of airs you know they in in krishna talks about the demonia characteristics dambha darpa and abhiman there are three characteristics and the comment in the vedant deshika in his commentary he gives a quite a interesting expression dambha darpa and abhiman so they all seem proper translates pride conceit and something he translates that it seems very similar but there are these are all expressions of ego but there is a difference mm -hmm. that basically <clears throat> abhiman is seeking honor or you know we could say is pride and especially respect we have pride we seek respect for what we have mm -hmm. especially we seek public respect that means that say if some guest comes to a particular place maybe and that person maybe it's a student gathering and somebody is a professor somebody is a phd somebody is a big person and they come over there and they expect that i should be publicly welcomed i should be publicly honored like abhiman refers to especially visible public honor for who one is mm -hmm. darpa refers to more of so this is more of showing off what we have mm -hmm. now darpa is more of respect in one seeks a lot of respect in interpersonal relationships that means like if you're talking with someone and if one time while referring to their name you don't refer prabhu you know oh, how dare you know, who do you think you are it's like i oh, like i want devotee he told me he said that person is so disrespectful i said why what happened he said he always calls me prabhu it should be calling me prabhu ji <laughs> <laughs> oh god it's a, i'm anyway so sometimes people can take such small things very big but you know dambha is the worst at least in darpa and abhiman abhiman is more public respect darpa is more interpersonal respect but dambha is where one seeks respect for qualities one doesn't have <laughs> it's like i am not a millionaire hmm Like I say, many times people go for weddings in Amazon. You know, they have free one one month returns in America and other places. In India, they don't have that. What happened was that many times, like people, they buy very expensive clothes. They have to go for a wedding or something. They buy clothes which will be super expensive, and by wearing those clothes, they act as if I am very wealthy. And then after they finish the wedding, they go and return those clothes to Amazon. So. it's like you pretend to be wealthier than what you are so that is dambha so when somebody puts on airs that means they are acting as if they are bigger than what they are somebody is not an expert in a field and then they act just they just use some jargon and they claim to have this they claim to be expert in that field for what they don't have now at that time now if we know that they are not expert and then somebody asks a question to them that exposes their their deceptiveness and that person is just left silent and now if that person was seeking more respect than what they normally merit then when they are disrespected there's a little bit of a joy in that you know it serves you right you are demanding pride for pride in what you didn't have So, so Duryodhan was like that. He was putting on airs, and that's why when somebody is constantly trying to claim respect, and when that person is put down, there's a little joy in that. 
So the, the Queen's laugh, it was not a malicious laugh. It is just an innocent laugh. It is not that they harbored some secret grudge against him and it is just an innocent laugh at that time. Now Krishna, he let them go on because he wanted to provoke Duryodhan. See, a person's boundaries are revealed when they are provoked. So how far would he go? How bad a person would he be? See, the previous two attacks on the Pandavas that Duryodhana had done were in the dark. He had secretly tried to poison Bhima and he had secretly tried to burn them alive. But now, when he did this, the gambling match was in public. The attempt to disrobe Draupadi was in public. That really brought his dark character out for everyone to see. Like say somebody commits a crime where there is no eyewitness. Then that person has committed a crime. But suppose somebody comes to a police station and in the middle of the police station commits the crime. That means that person has no fear of the law at all. That's a really dangerous criminal. So Duryodhan's character comes out like that. So, you know, I was a part, once a part of a vigilance committee and there was some senior devotee who had done something terribly wrong. Now, generally anybody who is in leadership position, there are some people who like that person, some people who dislike that person. So, what happened was, that the, we were discussing what to do, and what disciplinary action to take. So, this one devotee was saying that, you know, it's just the post. Like somebody gets a very big, very powerful post, then power corrupts. So it says that, you know, he's a good person, but he was put in a post and there was no accountability, there were no peers. And that's why I said power corrupts. And that's why I said the main action we should take is that is remove him from that post and he'll be a nice devotee. He will continue practicing his bhakti. Another devotee was saying, he says, power doesn't corrupt. Power exposes the corruption that is already there. Now, which is true? Now, the other devotee was also, he was telling some other examples of something like what had happened similarly. So now the thing is, my understanding is that it can be both. See, we all have some anarthas within us. We all have some lust, we all have some anger, we all have some, en some envies. All of these are there inside us. And when we get a situation of power, that time, it is not, it could be that there is anartha inside and it grows, grows, grows. So when you say power corrupts, it's not that there is, if there is no corruption inside, it's not likely that it's going to come out. But at the same time, it is not necessary that that level of corrupt sharam was already there inside the person. It is that when the opportunity comes, when the power comes, like generally, if I, if I get angry at someone and if if maybe that person can't uh, speak back to me. But then I'm in a community where there are my equals, there are my seniors and somebody tells me, you know, you should not be speaking like this. You are abusing your power. Then that's a det deterrent for me. But if I'm in a community where I'm the sole leader and if I yell at someone, there's no one there to stand up to me. Then what is going to happen is, see, some, we all tend to push, push, the boundaries of what is acceptable at times. Can I get away with this? And if I get away with one thing, then we not only do the same thing again, but we do something worse. We do something worse. And slowly, the corruption that is there inside can become worse. So, the point I'm making over here is that it doesn't have to be that power corrupts or power exposes the corruption within. It can be both. That we all have anarthas inside us. And if there is an opportunity, if there is a provocation, if we are not on guard, then that corruption will grow within us. That, that greed, that envy, that lust, that will grow within us. So now if we have some good sense, then when it starts growing to an alarming degree, then we just stop. Just stop. So, so, so I was talking with one devotee in, um, in uh, Canada, he, 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 was, he was the Alcoholics Anonymous and our devotees have created a BRG, a Bhakti Recovery Group, which basically helps people who are addicted to come out of addictions. So he was an Alcoholics Anonymous and then he came to the Bhakti Recovery Group. 
so he told me I, uh, how did he uh, how did he start his recovery journey so he said he used to drink and in the west there is the idea drink but don't get drunk that's a common idea over there it's like you know go on the edge of a cliff or maybe a huge two kilometer cliff or something or a huge tall cliff look down bend down look down as much as you want but don't fall down well why take the risk but anyway so that was common drinking is very common in the west so he said when he would drive, get drink he would he would uh, he would sometimes swear and he would speak foul words he would get angry also so he said one day I, I was drunk and something bad something had gone wrong in his project in his office and he was very frustrated and he came back home and you know, in his anger he was drunk and he smashed a wall and he smashed a wall and he saw that his wife and child were, and both of them were shivering and then he realized that both of them were afraid that I might do something to them like that. He said, no matter how drunk I am, I am never going to hurt them. But the very thought that my actions have created a fear like this in someone else, that made me realize, I have to change. So that's when I immediately joined Alcoholics Anonymous and that we had a devotee and he joined the Bhakti Recovery Group. Now he's become a we not only become a, he's leader of a bhakti recovery group now. So the point is, see, when we do something wrong, we might have power and we may keep doing something wrong. We're slowly pushing the boundaries of what is acceptable. Hmm? And, but at some particular time we are jolted. Hey, this is not who I am. This is not what I'm meant to be doing. And at that time, do we stop? Do we stop? So that's what Duryodhan never expressed any regret for what he had done. His only regret was that his scheme was not successful. <laughs> so, he thought that, you know, he, I wanted to disrobe Draupadi, but somehow something happened and uh, we couldn't succeed in that. So, that was his only regret. Now, Karna also participated in the disrobing of Draupadi. Karna was the person who suggested that Draupadi be dragged into the assembly. But to his credit, Karna later expresses regret twice. Once to Krishna and one to B, once to Bhishma. So, somebody does something wrong and horribly wrong and there is not even a slight regret in it. Then that is really a dark character. So, what is happening over here is that Krishna is taking this series of events in such a way that Duryodhan's darkness becomes exposed for the world. And once it is exposed, then when the war is fought, everybody knows it is because of Duryodhan. It is not because of the Pandavas. And that brings us to the last part. said about provocation, See, protection. Each one of us needs to do what is required for our protection. So, <clears throat> that means even when we are put in a situation, say, which we, we, are, we are exposed to some provocation, despite our intention. It's not that we went into temptation. It's that we are just going along our normal life and suddenly we get power, we get temptation, we get something and we start getting agitated, we start getting shaken. See, our protection is our responsibility. It is not anyone else's responsibility. So, Sir Devodi asked me this question. Sir. Ajamil was going... Uh, to do a good thing. He was going to serve his father. He had gone to get his get firewood for his father. And yet he succumbed. So when he was simply, his father was in one sense like his guru. So there's no, no, no mention in the Bhagavatam of he being initiated by anyone else. And he was clearly a Brahmana as well as a, to some extent a devotee. So when he was going to do service to someone who was at least one of his gurus, then why did this happen to him? Why did this fall, fall off into him? So, the answer I gave at that time is that you know one instruction does not supersede other instructions. It, like if our guru tells us, you know, can you go and we have this festival coming up, can you go and shop and buy these things? Okay, 
Now the guru doesn't have to tell you when you are driving, you have to follow the traffic rules. See, that's obvious, is it? <laughs> if somebody says, oh, I was going for my guru's instructions and I went over the speed limit and the cops pulled me over. Well, you don't expect that the car, you can be protected from breaking the law just because you are following the guru's instructions, isn't it? One of my devotee friends, he says that, he says, if you drive above the speed limit, sometimes there was one devotee used to drive way fast and he says, Krishna will protect his devotees. So, this devotee told him, you know, if you drive above the speed limit, Krishna leaves the car. <laughs> <laughs> So, what that means is that, like, you don't have to tell a person to drive safely, drive within safe legal limits. Yes, you have to do a service, but that's, that's basic common sense. So, similarly, when we have to do a service, that service does protect us. But that doesn't mean that we can take any and every risk. The basic instruction is, Dhyayata Vishayan Pumsa leads to problems. So, Yada Samharate Chayam. We have to withdraw our senses from the sense objects. So sometimes, in the course of our service also, we may be provoked. So if we are provoked, then it is important for us to do what it takes to protect ourselves. It is our, our doing our service is our responsibility, but protecting our consciousness is also our responsibility. And if we consider this is where Duryodhan also uh, play, made a mistake. Many mistakes he made. This was, you see, he had been invited for the ceremony. And he stayed on for the ceremony. He came for the ceremony. That's fair enough. But everybody went back and he stayed on. It's what's going to happen. If you already know there is envy within you. And he says, I want to see the palace of the Pandavas. Well, what are you going to see? The more you're going to see, the more is going to trigger envy within you. Isn't it? So, if we know... So there was a cultural or a familial requirement into the ceremony and he was invited, he had to come. But if the envy is going to be triggered more, then don't stay there. So for all of us, uh, we have to be, be careful about doing what it takes to protect ourselves. So now I'll conclude with the last point. See, there's a difference between lust and envy. And that is, it is a significant thing. Generally, see if there is some, sexu some sensual desire within us, then we easily understand that we should not be contemplating on it. In what to speak of spiritual society, even in ordinary society, you know, staring at someone is considered impolite. So, dhyayato, we understand that there is some danger in it. But what happens if the respect to envy is that we are expected? See, if some other devotee has done some wonderful service, now we are told that we should celebrate other success. But sometimes, say, if I am a preacher and somebody else is a preacher, or I am a book distributor and somebody else is a book distributor, and if that other devotee is being rewarded, now that devotee may have done more service than me, that devotee is being rewarded, then I may think I am there as a service. But if that devotee is being glorified and glorified and glorified, and the more I am hearing that devotee's glorification, the more the envy within me is growing. Now we may say it should not happen. We should not be feeling envious. We should be thinking that that actually it's Krishna's mission that is spreading. And more books are being distributed. When more people are coming for his class or my class, ultimately more souls are being benefited. So that's how we should be thinking. And yes, that's true. But you know, we can't just give a should instruction to our feelings. You know, if only if our feelings were obeying our instructions, life would be so easy. Isn't it? Don't feel angry. Don't feel lusty. Don't feel jealous. Okay. I will not feel. Our mind is not our obedient servant. You would like it to be, but it is not. So, if we find that, say, hearing somebody else's glorification is fueling the envy within us, then maybe as a part of courtesy, we can be there for some time. But we don't have to let that envy get fueled more and more. We, it is our responsibility. If we can't celebrate it, somebody's success, that means we are conditioned. That is true. But it is we who have to deal with our conditioning. Maybe then we spend some time, be polite, we speak our few words appreciating that person, and then we can leave. We don't have to expose. I'm not saying disrespect the other person, not at all. I'm, the point I'm making is that in some ways, our culture is such that without even our, we are told, 
give respect to others, glorify others. And what may happen is in, in, the, in others being glorified, we might find that our envy is being triggered more and more. And if that is happening, then we would like to get rid of the envy. But while the envy is there, at least let it not be further inflamed. So then we may have to do what it takes for protecting ourselves. So that's why for us, each one of us, we have to take the responsibility to protect our consciousness. And if we don't, see protection can be, protection can be in three ways, which I'll conclude this one. Protection is avoid the provocation. Hmm? Sometimes, like I said, with respect to lust, it may be possible to avoid contemplation. Sometimes it's not possible with lust also because we just go out, going about our going out of our work, and there are so many people who who seem to have so little money to put on clothes on their body. <laughs> Isn't it? So they have a lot of money, but uh, they're stingy. Let's put it politely. So, but we, we can't avoid provocation at times. We can't do anything about that. But then, if we can't avoid provocation, at least minimize the provocation. Mm -hmm. We can't go around a road with closed eyes, but let's not keep our eyes open looking for sense objects. Isn't it? Same way if something envy is being triggered, let's not fuel the envy more. And if in spite of that, even if we try to minimize the provocation, still we get provoked, then seek help. Uh, talk with some senior devotee. That's where we need someone some close friend, when you say bodhayanta parasparam, guhyanti akhyati pruchyati. What it means is sometimes when our anarthas are troubling us, then we need someone with whom we can talk. Sometimes when we have this, uh, we all are trying to do lots of services for Krishna and we have a competitive mood. The competition is nice, it inspires us to serve Krishna more. But competition can lead to some power posturing, where you know, I can't tell any of my problems to anyone else. Because I'm afraid that person will exploit my problems and will try to uh, try to put me down. But we need close friends. We need some, at least one or two people whom we can trust. And that way, we can protect ourselves. Duryodhan had Bhishma and Drona, but Duryodhan didn't turn towards them. When Duryodhan came back, the only person he was talking was with Shakuni. So instead of seeking, uh, seeking to extinguish the fire of envy, he sought the associate of somebody who gave further fuel to the fire of envy. Rather, he gave him a whole scheme. Okay, how can you act on your envy? That is the most dangerous kind of association. And that's how this whole tragedy unfortunately unfolded eventually. So I'll summarize. I discussed today three main points. So first was about the purpose of explicit, explicit descriptions. So, when there are sensuous or explicit descriptions in scripture, what is their purpose? So, we discuss three levels. There is romantic, then there is where, where primarily it is the relationship between two people. Then there is erotic and there is pornographic. So, there is nothing pornographic in scripture directly. Although it might trigger desire, the purpose is not to trigger desire. So, romantic means basically it serves a narrative purpose. So, the narrative purpose that is served by the explicit description here is to describe how Duryodhan's envy is triggered. That's the reason why this whole squirting of liquids on their bodies of the queens and everything is being described. Then we discussed, the major part of the class was <coughs> this point of provocation. That sometimes Krishna provokes us. So, now here we discuss how Krishna is the supreme controller, but not the, does anyone remember? Soul controller. It is not that he is doing everything. It is we have free will. And so Krishna, Krishna provoked, for example, Indra. But that was just, that was like a disease, like a doctor and a patient. Doctor getting the patient out of denial by triggering the disease. So how much, so how, how much is the disease, how much is the impurity within us? How do we know that? 
sometimes it is when we are provoked to push our boundaries like a person's character is known by what boundaries they will never push i may get i no matter how angry i get i am not going to speak fear words that's a boundary so now to indra's credit when he realized what i had done oh he he regretted and then he reformed but duryodhan the only regret was his scheme did not work out so when krishna provoked duryodhan the point was the whole world could see how dark was his character and because of that eventually that small fire of envy here that envy led to atrocity in the gambling match and then that led to the catastrophe at kurukshetra so it is not that krishna caused it so does power corrupt or does power expose the corruption that is inside no power may trigger or activate the corruption that is inside but it is it also reveals whether we are ready to fight the corruption or we are ready to let the corruption go further and that brings us to the last point well, third was protection and it is our responsibility to protect our consciousness and that means that we discussed how lust and envy are different normally we are not we are not told to expose us to the object of lust but if somebody is glowing glorified we are expected to celebrate their their success and now it is good if we can but if we can't then it's our responsibility to protect our consciousness we are talking about three levels of avoid provocation that is the first level of protection second is if we can't avoid then minimize the provocation so yada samharate and <clears throat> yada samharate just avoid the provocation but uh, <coughs> minimize the provocation is where we don't no we don't do dhyayato we will drishyato might be there but no dhyayato and then last is seek help so in this way we all can protect ourselves from whatever anarthas might be troubling us in our lives thank you very much hare krishna so sorry we don't have any time for questions today i have to catch a flight thank you very much granthraj shrimad bhagavatam ki shila prabhupad ki gaur bhakt vrind ki itai gaur premanand ki hare krishna